Hello, welcome to today's uh, program. Uh, I am Patrick Hines, the pastor of Brittle Heights Presbyterian Church in Kingsport, Tennessee, and I'm joined today uh, by the usual suspects, the usual cast that we've had so far here, uh, Pastor Henry Johnson uh, from uh, Trinity Presbyterian Church in Tazewell, Virginia, and uh, uh, Brother J Jim Thornton. I always want to call you James because that's on your email, J James Thornton. Yeah. Uh, but but you usually go by Jim, Pastor Jim Thornton of Reformed Faith Presbyterian Church in Clarksville, Tennessee. Continuing on our discussion about God's decree, we're going to talk today about unconditional election. Martin Luther, in his book, The Bondage of the Will, wrote, quote, If any man would ascribe even the smallest part of his salvation to his free will, he knows nothing of grace and has not learned Jesus Christ, end quote. In our last program, we discussed God's comprehensive pre-creation immutable decree or plan that encompasses all that comes to pass for the purpose of God's own glory. In today's program, we move on to the next points in chapter three of the Westminster Confession of God's Eternal Decree, wherein we will discuss the heart of biblical grace, the blessed doctrine of God's unconditional election of his beloved church. In the debates that take place today and local churches and online, one will often hear people say, oh, you're a Calvinist, or oh, you're an Arminian. But what do these words really mean? Are the issues that divided these two groups really that important, or is it just theologians splitting hairs? After the Reformation took hold in the Netherlands, a theologian named Jacob Arminius, who lived from 1559 to 1609, was facing allegations from the Reformed Church in that region. In response, Arminius delivered, or, delivered orally before the states at Holland at The Hague, which was the place of the Dutch government, his famous Declaration of Sentiments. In that document, Arminius left no doubt what, what he believed regarding the biblical teaching on predestination and the salvation of sinners. Arminius said, quote, This decree to save or condemn certain persons has its foundation in divine foreknowledge through which God has known from all eternity those individuals who, through the established means of his prevenient grace, would come to faith and believe, and through his subsequent sustaining grace, would persevere in the faith. Likewise, in divine foreknowledge, God knew those who would not believe and persevere, end quote. This position was a comprehensive departure from the teachings of all the Reformed Confessions at that time, particularly the Belgic Confession and the Heidelberg Catechism. About 10 years after Arminius's death, the controversy had escalated to such a level that an international synod was called to address it, known today as the Synod of Dort, 1618 to 1619. With the Arminian Remonstrants, as they were called, they were protesting. They presented five points of doctrine which they wanted to use to revise the Belgic Confession and the Heidelberg Catechism. The Synod responded with what came to be later known as the so-called Five Points of Calvinism. And while the famous acrostic tulip is how people normally refer to those five uh, responses to the five errors of the Arminians, the actual order of the points in the Canons of Dort themselves is ultip. The first point is unconditional election. That was in direct response to Arminius's teaching that God's election of individuals to salvation was based entirely upon what he foresaw they would do as God looked down the corridors of time and learned it. In effect, sinners elect themselves in this scheme to salvation, and God's predestination of them is in response to what sinners do independently of him. The Synod of Dort's canons uh, refer repeatedly to the errors of Pelagius, I remember reading the Canons of Dort for the first time, and I wasn't even sure what they were referring to, but again and again in the Canons of Dort, the, the document says, quote, this savers of Pelagius, quote, these bring out of hell the Pelagian error, quote, these seek to instill into the people the destructive poison of the Pelagian errors, quote, as the Pelagians of old asserted, quote, the proud heresy of Pelagius, and I found even three more references, but I won't read them all to you. What was this gross error of Pelagianism, and who was Pelagius? Well, one needs to go back over a thousand years prior to the rise of Arminianism to see this. It was the great church father, Augustine, who lived from 354 to 430 AD, who took up the cause of defending biblical teaching against the British monk Pelagius, whose teaching denied original sin. 
When one looks at Augustine's anti-Pelagian writings from the time period, it is ne nearly identical to the Arminian Calvinist debate of the 17th century, and also to the debate between Luther and Erasmus in the 16th century, where Erasmus, the Roman Catholic priest and humanist scholar, wrote his book on the freedom of the will, and Martin Luther wrote his volcanic blast of a response in the bondage of the will. What is original sin? What is grace? Why must grace be free and unconditional in order to be grace at all? Who saves who? What could be more important than these questions? Really nothing. These are the issues we're going to discuss today. So uh, Jim and Henry, thank you again for uh, uh, coming on. I really appreciate you guys and your, your comments and wisdom. So uh, Henry, I want to come to you first. How does the Calvinist Arminian debate mirror the Augustinian Pelagian controversy in the fourth and fifth centuries, as well as the debate between Rome and the Reformation and Luther and Erasmus? Well, all of those controversies basically involve who gets the glory when people are saved. That's the bottom line. Is it ultimately up to man to save himself, or does God get the glory when sinners are brought to salvation by the grace of God in a simple childlike faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? And that controversy um, is, is really underneath. Uh, you mentioned the uh, problem of denying original sin. Uh, you mm -hmm. threw out uh, this term in that quote, prevenient grace. And so those are, are uh, concepts. And the bottom line is, what does the Bible say? Um, it, does the Bible teach? Uh, that uh, uh, people are not so affected by the fall that they can, um, they have some spark of, of goodness within themselves uh, that um, if they act upon that, then God in response to that looks ahead and says, oh, uh, I'll choose that one because they chose me. And we'll just look at a couple of verses of Scripture. First of all, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Here the Apostle Paul is um, writing to his young apprentice, a young pastor, a son in the faith, Timothy. And in verse uh, 8 of 2 Timothy chapter 1, the Apostle Paul, uh, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, said, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us. And now he's describing this God who has given this gospel, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. And so this verse flies in the face of what Pelagius said, what Jacob Arminius said, what his followers maintain, what the Church of Rome then and sadly to this day still teaches. Uh, and sadly, there are other denominations. Uh, Methodism uh, is an example of that. Uh, sadly, many Baptists have embraced this uh, unbiblical view of man, of the fall, and of who gets the glory when people are saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this verse says... It wasn't on the basis of anything man did, is doing, or will do, but it is by the grace of God. And that grace was poured out upon undeserving sinners even yeah. before the foundation of the world, before the ages. So yeah. I think that's what's in common with all of these um strains of basically this same unbiblical teaching 
uh, that we refer to today as Arminianism, but it had uh, it its expression there in uh, Augustine's day as he opposed the false teaching of this uh, British monk by the name of Pelagius. Yeah, yeah, very good. And uh, right before you you came into the the program uh, here, I had a before you came on onto the Zoom call. Jim and I were talking about uh, he, he was sharing a, a BB Warfield quote. Um, and Warfield uh, described the Reformation um, as the ultimate victory of Augustine's doctrine of grace over his doctrine of the church. And it really does go back to that Augustinian Pelagian controversy, the issue of sin. I mean, the issue of, of the fall, original sin, what the fall, what, what the consequences of the fall uh, uh, are is going to determine how we understand grace. So, Jim, I want to come to you with that next question. We've we've dropped this phrase, original sin. I think there's a lot of confusion about what original sin is and how uh, Adam's sin affected the human race. So, what is original sin, and what did the fall of man do to us? Well, the uh, w the first verse to deal with this is uh, in the uh, book of Genesis, where God warns them not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he says that if they were to do so, they would die. And then Satan comes along and says, you will not die, which is his modus operandi there in, in Genesis 3. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And for him to tell them they would be like God, it was basically that they would replace God on the throne, declaring according to their own fallen judgment what is good and evil. So they had eaten of the fruit, and uh, the fall affected their minds. It darkened their minds. Um, they were deceived by the devil. They were alienated from God. It affected their will. Uh, they no longer uh, wanted to obey God. And this is part of the original sin. This is part of spiritual death. There is a, a failure to want to please God. And um, not only the will, but the emotions were fallen too. And so even today, we see people who are being led by emotions. And emotions to many people today is more important than reason or logic. And so in Romans uh, chapter 3, uh, we have it further described, uh, beginning in verse 10, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. There's none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues, they keep deceiving. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Mm -hmm. So that sums it up right there in those terrible words, which are very offensive to people who think they're good. And see, that's part of the problem. That's part of the deception is that because of the fall, in our judgment, we we call good evil and evil good. And we uh, are very uh, prone to pass upon our own sin and think, oh, that's nothing. Everybody does it as if that was the standard instead of the law of God, which makes it quite clear. And, and the last thing I'll say about original sin is that a stick of dynamite does not have to go off to be a stick of dynamite. In other words, we don't see people normally as bad as Hitler or Charles Manson, but yet the effects of the fall are there, and they're not always manifesting themselves. So did the fall, uh, is, is the corruption that we inherit from Adam, is, is there, isn't there just a little tiny part of us that wasn't affected by that? <laughs> No, it's it's total total depravity. Uh, it's it's even uh, part of the result is that we tend to think that that we're pretty good that it wasn't a complete ruin. 
So mm-hmm. that's part of the deception. It, it, it's a total. That's why uh, it's called total depravity. Right. And during the the Augustinian Pelagian controversy, the real the real issue that comes into the into the forefront there is what is the decisive factor in salvation, as Henry was pointing out. Uh, is it in the final analysis? It, it, does man play a, a decisive role in his salvation? And the the Reformed fathers there in the Netherlands, when they address the Arminian controversy, they they refer to the teachings of Arminius and to the Arminian Remonstrance as Pelagian and Pelagius and Pelagianism eight times in the canons. And so I wanted to ask uh, Henry, why did they do that? Why why did they see a direct parallel? between what the Arminians were saying about this and Pelagianism. Why why do they keep saying that? Well, I think the root of it is this denial of the condition of man because of the fall. Um, The scriptures are very clear. Uh, For example, in Ephesians chapter 2 and Romans chapter 5, Here are two passages. Uh, Brother Jim mentioned Romans uh, chapter 3. And uh, if you read on in Romans chapter 3, the very next verse, in verse 19 of Romans 3, it says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God for, by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. And so does the Bible teach that there is this spark of of goodness in man that God uh, uh, kind of blows a, a little bit on that ember? And if man then responds to that uh, prevenient grace, then that's how people are saved. And Romans chapter 5 and Ephesians chapter 2 are two passages that uh, declare very clearly that man's condition is not that he's just in trouble. It's been likened to somebody falling out of of the the 10th floor of a building um, and you fall down on the sidewalk. Um, Arminianism uh, basically says, yes, the fall was bad, but there's still this spark of life, uh, of goodness, and that uh, the man's on the sidewalk, uh, he's hurting, he's aching, uh, he's his bones are all broken, but he's still alive, and he uh, uh, claws his way over to uh, the uh, um, uh, 911 uh, uh, phone and, and calls for help. Um, that's not what scripture teaches. Um, yeah. The fall when man fell in Adam, uh, death occurred. And yes. Ephesians chapter 2 Um, is a passage that I think is very helpful. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of, of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Well, what delivered us from this condition of spiritual death? We were spiritual zombies uh, walking around in spiritual darkness, spiritual death. What changed uh, a, a, a person who is joined to Christ? What caused that change to take place? And verse four tells us, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, 
you have been saved. And so those who are fallen in Adam are not just sick with sin, but we're yeah. dead. And the yeah. only way dead people can be alive is not that they take the first step toward making themselves alive and then God does the rest. But that yeah. God is the one who, according to his plan, to save a particular people that he gave to his son. And the language of scripture is just uh, all through the Bible. God's choosing to set his love. Uh, it doesn't say that God looks ahead and sees who will choose him. And that's who he chooses. Uh if that were the case, in reality, no one would be a Christian. But God, yeah. who is rich in mercy, he set his love upon us. Now, Ephesians 1 tells us when he did that. He did yeah. that before the foundation of the world. Um, yeah. And it was not that God is responding to man. Um, that's yeah. the scheme of Arminianism. And if that is the case, yeah. then the ultimate or at least part of the glory uh, that uh, is to be given because of, of sinners being saved would go to man if the Arminian yeah. scheme is correct. But scripture teaches us all the praise goes to God. Uh, right. I was dead. And why do <laughs> I love Jesus now? It's because God touched my heart and made me alive, opened my blind eyes, took yeah. out my heart of stone and gave me a heart that beats and throbs for Jesus. And that's yeah. what we see all through scripture. If, uh, Ezekiel chapter 36, uh, God told Ezekiel that here's what will happen when Messiah comes. I'm going to send my spirit and take out their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. And of course, the vision of the uh, valley of the dry bones. Uh, yeah. How can those bones be made alive? It's not that the bones start making themselves alive. It is that God called Ezekiel to speak his word to those bones and prayed for the spirit to come and bless the preaching of the gospel. And that's what made those dead bones alive. And that's how sinners are made alive. That's why you love Jesus. That's why I love Jesus. It's all God's work. And it's according to the plan that he made before the foundation of the world. Now, I'm not going to read Romans 5, but in Romans 5, verses 12 and following, we see that through one man, sin entered and everybody died and everybody sinned through the one man, Adam. And had God not planned and executed the plan for the last Adam to come, nobody would be saved. And right. it is in the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the plan of God, according to what God planned and purchased on the cross and now is applying by his spirit. And in John chapter 6, verse 37, the Lord Jesus says, all that the Father gives me shall come to me, and the one who comes to me I will in no wise cast out. Uh, yeah. John chapter 10, Jesus talked about those unbelieving Pharisees. Now, I don't know who God has chosen. Jesus did because he's God in the flesh. But mm -hmm. he said to those Pharisees, you don't believe because you are not God's oh. sheep. Yeah. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And in John chapter 17, the father gave a people to his son and Jesus came to die for those particular people 
And the Holy Spirit comes now and makes those particular people alive. Our job is to proclaim the gospel, calling all men everywhere to repent. And God is the one who saves dead, lost sinners, all for his praise. That's right. And so that when the, the Senate of Dort there, when they're responding to the the Arminians, and they keep referring to it as Pelagianism. This is Pelagius. Um, it, it does go back to really the Arminians were denying original sin. They they were really denying that God alone receives the glory, and they were denying the effects of the fall on man. Uh, as you already alluded to some passages, just listen to a couple of these. Um, Jeremiah thirteen twenty three. Can an Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Neither can you do good who are accustomed to do evil. Um, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 18, a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. It is not able to bear good fruit. Uh, Jesus said in John 3, verse 3 to Nicodemus there, unless a man is born from above, he is not able to see the kingdom of God. John 6, 44, no one is able to come to me unless the Father sent me draws him. And many more passages, so Romans 8, 7, the sinful mind does not submit to the law of God, nor is it able to do so. 1 Corinthians 2, 14, uh, the man without the Spirit of God does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So not able, not able, not able, not able. And the Arminians were saying, well, God does kind of this preemptory work of grace that gets you out of that disabled con condition so you can be the decisive factor. And they, they, as students of church history and of Scripture, saw this is a revival of Pelagianism. Because they're saying the decisive factor is with man, not God. And that's a, a huge problem. So, Brother Jim, let's go, go to the next uh, point there. The opening paragraph of the Synod of Dort uh, teaches an essential truth of biblical Christianity that's been lost in our day. The very opening paragraph of the Council of, of at Dort there, their response to the Arminians, the first thing they point out is God's right to condemn all people. Point number one, article one of heading of number one, as all men have sinned in Adam, lie under the curse and are deserving of eternal death, God would have done no, no injustice by leaving them all to perish and delivering them over to condemnation on account of sin, according to the words of the apostle, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. And verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. So would you comment on that? Is it really, would it really have violated nothing about fairness for everyone to go to hell? I would say uh, God is not obligated to save anybody. The only obligation is co to condemn everybody because we've all sinned. And um, <clears throat> if we had a neighbor who was clearly guilty of something, and deserve to be punished, and we had a local judge who refused to punish that person, we would say that that judge is unjust. Well, yeah. God, in his perfect justice, uh, is required uh, by his own nature, by his own character. He condemns sin. And so um, that's why the scripture says he is just and the justifier. The yeah, way that he yeah. forgives is by having his justice satisfied by mm -hmm. Jesus hanging between heaven and earth on that cross, nailed to that cross, paying the penalty for the sins of his people, and then declaring it is finished. Well, what was finished? The payment, the payment yeah. for the sin that uh, sinners could be forgiven and set free. Mm -hmm. And I would add to that. Um, that it says in Peter, Second uh, Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah and eight persons, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning mm -hmm. the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes condemned uh, with an overflow, making uh, an overthrow, making them an example 
unto those that afterwards should live ungodly. Um, <clears throat> I was talking to somebody the other day that lives uh, right up there in Kentucky. Uh, right here, I was talking to him in this region. And I asked him if they knew that there were seashells up on top of Black Mountain, the tallest mountain in Kentucky, right over there by Big Stone Gap. And they did not know it. And there's even seashells on uh, <clears throat> Mount Everest, the tallest mountain in the world, I believe. Well, there was a flood, and God yeah. destroyed all but Noah and his family, who were justified by faith. Uh, mm -hmm. He did not spare the angels, but yeah. uh, he didn't have to spare mankind. But yeah. in his mercy and his mercy alone, uh, his grace he saves his people and not, not out of any obligation at all. Right. So if God, if God was, was only holy and just, um, the whole human race, myself, you, Henry, everyone, uh, everyone that we've ever known would rightly, uh, justly be sent to hell for our sins and there'd be nothing unfair about it so, so often people object to man you're you're saying god unconditionally uh, elects this person to be saved and then that person's not going to be saved but the starting point is everybody's already damned everyone's already depraved and evil and loves being that way and would not want anything to do with god anyway and so that's the first point of the synod there on divine predestination. God has the right to condemn the human race. So, Henry, here's the second article, and I want you to comment on, on this after I read it. And what, what this is about is predestination, unconditional election, is a manifestation of the incredible and indescribable love of God for this massive, damned, lost humanity. Article 2 says, But in this the love of God was manifested that he sent his only begotten son into the world, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So, Henry, would you comment on how divine predestination manifests not the unfairness of God, but the love of God. In the book of Acts, the Lord Jesus appeared to the Apostle Paul. Uh, the Apostle Paul had been preaching uh, in a, a, a place called Corinth. Um, Corinth was a, a cesspool. Uh, yeah. The Greek world in that day had coined a new word. Um, if somebody became so um, morally corrupt, uh, debauched, uh, they were referred to as someone who had been parenthesized. Uh, Corinth was just a, a moral cesspool. And the Lord sent his apostle... Uh, to proclaim the gospel, the good news. And one of the attacks by Pelagius, uh, by Armenians, is uh, that the offer of the gospel uh, is not genuine if um, everybody is not able to um, be saved. And the answer to that is what we have just been looking at. None of us, I don't deserve to be saved, but God in his amazing mercy and grace um, planned before the foundation of the world to save, as John Newton wrote, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Uh, God did not look down through the annals of history and go, ooh, now there's a good one. I'm going to save him. No, um, the Lord has set his love upon undeserving 
wicked sinners. And he, as the Apostle Paul was being threatened with his very life, as he preached the gospel there in Corinth, the Lord Jesus came to him. And I want to read what he, what he told the Apostle Paul. Uh, in verse 9, we read, And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many people, many who are my people in this mm. city. Now, these were people, how were they people that were my people? Well, it, it was because of the mercy and grace and love of God. And the Apostle Paul had been sent there with the gospel. And the gospel offer is, whosoever will, come to Jesus. That offer is a genuine offer, and it is made, as we read in Acts chapter 17, verse 39, God is declaring or commanding all men everywhere to repent. And we earnestly... Uh, as ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ, offer the gospel. And that is a genuine offer that anyone who <laughs> repents and turns to Jesus will be yeah. saved. And that's the message we <laughs> preach. And yeah. it is God's commission to us. And so this... Yeah. Getting back uh, to your question to come around, uh, this, this matter of how does the predestinating love of God, uh, how does that fit with the love of God? Well, it is the reality that if God had not planned to save anyone, no one would be saved. And that is the incredible uh, demonstration of God's love that he would save anybody, let alone, as the book of Revelation describes for us, a multitude that no man can number will be yeah. in heaven. And yeah. who gets to heaven? Those who repent and believe in Jesus. And That's how right. can dead people repent and believe in Jesus? God, the Holy Spirit, comes and makes dead people alive and takes out their heart of stone and gives them a heart of repentance and faith. My job, your job as preachers of the gospel is to do what we see God telling Ezekiel to do there in Ezekiel 37, to speak the word of God to those dead bones. bones. And to cry yeah. and pray to God that his spirit will bless his word and make dead people alive to repent and believe in Jesus. And so that's yeah. how uh, the Bible portrays this. You see Pelagius and Arminius and the people who follow in their uh, false teaching down to this day. They basically deny what God says about himself. Right. That God is sovereign, and they deny what God says about man, that man is fallen and spiritually dead, and they deny yeah. what the Bible teaches about who gets the glory when people are saved, and the Bible yeah. teaches us when we get to heaven, what are we going to do? We will take the crown that Jesus has gifted to us, and what are we going to do with it? We it's are going to throw it at the feet of Jesus as a symbol, as an expression. The only reason I'm here is all because of what you have done, what you planned, what you purchased, and what you applied to me and kept me. We yeah. will not stand there in the throne room of heaven patting ourselves on the back. Yeah. Henry, you did a good job. You made yeah. it. No, mm -hmm. we're going to be falling on our face before the living God, praising him for his grace and mercy yeah. and love. And it's that love yeah. that we offer to people.
We tell people, yeah. look, God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, as we read yeah. in Ezekiel 18. And yeah. we offer people, why will you perish? Run to Jesus and be saved. And when people reject the, the gospel, it just shows how hard and full of hate and wickedness we all are apart from the grace of God. And yeah. I would still be denying Jesus had God not planned to redeem me, purchased salvation for me, and sovereignly applied it to me. And that's true yeah. for every true child of God. That's right. So when we get to heaven, we're going to be praising Jesus for having saved us, not for having made our salvation possible. Amen. Right? He actually does all the saving. Now, I want to come to Jim and talk about um, the preaching of the gospel. I want to read a Spurgeon quote uh, before I uh, read the, the question here. Spurgeon says, If God would have painted a yellow stripe on the backs of the elect, I would go around lifting shirts. But since he didn't, I must <laughs> preach whosoever will, and when whatsoever believes, I know that he is one of the elect. Just as uh, Acts thirteen forty eight says, as many as were appointed to eternal life believe. So, Jim, many people say, hey, if God's already chosen everyone he's going to save, then we don't need to do evangelism or anything, right? Because it's all been determined by God. And uh, Article 3, in the same heading, you know, we looked at Article 1, Article 2, and Article 3 under Divine Predestination and Synod of Dort says this, and I want your comments. Article 3 says, and that men may be brought to believe... God mercifully sends the messengers of these most joyful tidings to whom he will and at what time he pleaseth, by whose ministry men are called to repentance and faith in Christ crucified. How then shall they call in, on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they are sent? So, Jim, God's already chosen it. What's the point of evangelism? Well, it, it would be a lot safer if we knew who the elect uh, are. But, you know, Paul prayed to be delivered from evil men as he was out preaching in public. He said, for not all have faith. And there were riots. Uh, if you look at Ephesus, there were riots when he was preaching. And uh, the disciples will not even let him go to be with the people out of fear that they would kill him. And uh, yeah. but yet uh, God gives us the grace to even risk our lives to preach the gospel and to enjoy it. Uh, and even to consider it an honor if we were to lose our lives preaching the gospel. Now, why do we do it? Because he commanded it. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. It's called the Great Commission there in Matthew 28. And uh, not only that, but God uses means and in uh, Romans chapter 10, we read this. Um, the scripture says, whoever believes upon him will not be put to shame. And I really like what Brother Henry was saying. You know, there is a universal offer of the gospel. Yep. Election is not really keeping people out. They're keeping them themselves out. They don't want to come. They love darkness rather than light. And we were the same way. We did too. And as Henry also said, the only reason that we've come to Christ is because he set us free. Uh, the word was preached to our dead bones, and we had no desire whatsoever until he set us free and gave it to us. But it goes on in Romans 10 to say, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call upon him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they preach unless they are sent? And so God gives us the privilege of being involved in bringing people to Jesus Christ. And, and isn't it kind of God, this wonderful work of salvation, that he would let us be involved in it? And so he sends, he sends us out to declare the gospel to the unbelieving. It may be on the radio. It may be on YouTube. Uh, it may be out in the open air preaching on the street, the sidewalk, the field. 
but uh, God sends his preachers and, and the people who send them are involved in this work. And, uh, and it's just, uh, the scripture goes on here in Romans 10, how beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim the good news of good tidings. And so it is just a wonderful work that God has commanded and that uh, he said to his disciples, follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. And one of the Puritans wrote a book on evangelism called Man Fishing. And so uh, <laughs> it's, it's just uh, the greatest thing I've ever been involved in. And the yeah. most wonderful thing that I've been involved in is, is evangelism. And I praise God yeah. for it. Yeah. One thing as we uh, kind of try to wrap up here a little bit, one thing that the Arminians um, past and present have tried to say is, look, you really can't be a student of the Bible and not have a doctrine of predestination and election. I mean, it's all over the place, as, as you guys have, have pointed out. And we haven't even really looked at some of the key. Some, there's so many other passages, John 6, John 10, John, John 17 has been alluded to Ephesians 1, Romans 9, Romans 8, yeah. many places we can look. But um, the Arminians tried to say, okay, well, God, God doesn't elect individuals. He doesn't elect people. He elects a category. He elects to save those who believe rather than electing. The way I've tried to teach this over the years is I've said, God doesn't elect Christ. He doesn't elect a plan. He doesn't elect who save those who believe. He elects individuals by name from all eternity. And that came up at the Synod of Dort, and they rejected that specific error. So, Brother Henry, would you um, share with us why why do we believe that when, we, when the Bible speaks of election unto salvation, it's not speaking about the election of a category of he, he elects to save believers, but rather his election is of individual people by name? Well, the bottom line that? is... That's what the Bible teaches. Uh, it, right. It's not that we have come up with some uh, theological um, deduction. This is is just the clear, blunt, plain teaching of Scripture. And, yeah. for example, over in John chapter 10, uh, mm -hmm. we have the Lord Jesus uh, explaining uh, that he is the good shepherd. And that the good yes. shepherd has laid down his life for his sheep. Yes. Um, not some nebulous uh, group of people that uh, I think, I don't remember whether it was you, Brother Jim, or, or you, Brother Patrick, mentioned that it's not that Christ has made salvation possible. Uh, it, the teaching of Scripture is that Christ has secured eternal redemption for his people. And that's what we see scripture teaching uh, here in John chapter 10. Um, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. And he calls his own sheep by name. Yeah, see, there's that particular that there's, there's a person who has a name, just like yes. sheep. Uh, there are individual sheep. It's not a, a nebulous group that right. God doesn't really know who's going to be in that group. That's not what scripture teaches. Here in John 10, Jesus says in verse 3, to him the gatekeeper opened the sheep, hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads yes. them out. Uh, Jesus yes. said, my sheep Listen to my voice. They won't listen to the voice of a stranger. And yeah. when we talk about the preaching of the gospel, there are those that God has officially pro, uh, uh, set apart to be preachers of the gospel in that technical sense. But in a very mm -hmm. real sense, all Christians are to be sharing the gospel. Um, yes. All of us are to be. You know, your granny is to be reading the Bible and sharing the good news of Jesus with her grandchildren. Uh, her, her grandpas are to be taking the word of God. Mamas and daddies are to be sharing the word of God. Sunday school teachers, um, 
people uh, that uh, we are uh, in in connection with, our neighbors, friends, we're to be sharing the gospel with everybody. Everybody is. But there yes. is the official proclamation of the gospel that these passages were referring to. And so sure. whether it is directly or whether it is that somebody else has taught us the word of God and we are sharing the gospel of Jesus, John 3, 16. It is particular people that yes. Jesus died to save. We see the same thing over in John chapter 17. Jesus says, I'm not praying for the world, but I'm praying yep. for the people whom Father, you have given me a particular people. Um, yep. uh, in Matthew chapter 1, when the angel appeared to Joseph saying, look, it's not what you think. <laughs> uh, <laughs> your uh, bride uh, has not been unfaithful. She is carrying the Son of God uh, in, in fulfillment of the prophecies in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 7. But he says he will save his people from their sins, a particular people. Mm -hmm. When the Apostle Paul uh, is, is writing in the epistles, uh, he talks about to the elect, to those who are chosen. You mentioned Romans chapter 9. Um, here we see that God set apart Pharaoh, a particular person. He left him in his sin. He wasn't unjust to do so, but he yeah. raised him up and used him as a particular person, as a trophy of God's wrath. And if you love Jesus today, the question isn't, is God unfair to not save everybody? The question is, why would God save somebody like me? That's what we Amen. ought to be astounded Amen. about. Amen. That's right. And, it, it, well said. Hmm. So that, that statement in Romans 9, uh, wh which one, wh when you first got saved, which part of the equation was, was harder to accept? Jacob I have loved or Esau I hated? Absolutely. And, you know, there was a man who went to see Charles Haddon Spurgeon one time. And he said, Pastor Spurgeon, I've got a passage that really is troubling me. And Spurgeon mm -hmm. said, well, what passage is that? He said, well, it's this passage that's quoted from Malachi over here in the book of Romans, chapter nine, Jacob, I've loved it, Esau, I've hated. And Spurgeon said, you know, that's interesting because that passage really eats at me, too. And he said, what part of the passage eats at you? And the man looked at Pastor Spurgeon. And he said, well, of course. He said, Esau, I've hated. And Spurgeon <laughs> said, well, you know, that's funny because that's not the part of the verse that eats at me. He says, I don't, under, I don't have any problem at all understanding why God would hate the denial and disdain and shenanigans of a man like Esau who sold the promises of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ for a bowl of red stew. He says, a bowl of red stew is worth more to me than the promises of, of Messiah. He says, I mean, what, what's hard to understand about that? He said, but what I can't get over is why God would love a Jacob. And he said, yes. why would he love yes. me? Because I'm just like Jacob. Jacob yeah. lied to his old blind daddy. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's pretty brutal. Yeah, uh, it conniving. Uh, it, it, it's just God's grace is amazing. John Newton. It really it. is. Amen. It really is. And um the predestination and election is not opposed to our coming. It's the one thing that assures that the gospel, the free offer of the gospel is going to have some takers. And as you pointed out, it's going to have a lot of takers. Uh, so vast, no man can count them. Um, and so I wanted to give uh, Jim, we lost you there for a second there, Jim. I wanted to give you a, just the opportunity. Do you have any final comments before, before we uh, wrap up here? We're not going to have time to go through Ephesians 1 and Romans 9. We might take a whole program and just walk through those gold mines. Um, maybe Amen. we'll do that, but but Jim, what are, what are your final comments on this well, topic? 
I just want to say I'm glad I'm not getting justice. I drive down the interstate and I see somebody pulled over. I see the blue lights flashing and I drive by and I thank the Lord that I'm not getting justice because there are times when I exceed the speed limit often unintentionally, but, um, I don't want justice. I want mercy. I want grace. And that's what salvation is. Uh, God doesn't owe it to us at all. But thank the Lord uh, in Christ and in Christ alone, we get what we don't deserve. We get uh, something that's not fair. We get mercy and grace, undeserved favor, mercy, and it's a gift. It's not wages. We don't earn it at all. And it's really so comforting that God did not leave uh, our salvation the way the Armenians think, because in their system of thought, it's possible that nobody would have been saved. But God set his love on the believer before the foundation of the world. He didn't leave anything up to chance. There is no such thing really as chance, as R.C. Sproul clearly uh, puts forth in his book. God set his love on the believer before the foundation of the world. Now, that's love. It's not love. Well, if they come, they come. No problem. If they don't come, no problem. No, no. He said they're going to come. So praise the Lord. It's been a great discussion. Thank you all. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you guys. And just, just to wrap up, um, the fact is the justice that is due to us, uh, was in fact laid on someone. It was laid on our savior and for all the sin, all the the pride and envy and the the lust and coveting and everything that we've done and thought word and deed was nailed to the cross of Christ and people listening to this. So maybe they're not familiar with the issue of unconditional election and what the Arminian Calvinist debate or the Augustinian Pelagian controversy is about. Maybe those are new terms to them, but a lot of people will hear this discussion and think, well, how, how can I know if I'm one of God's elect? How can I know if I'm one of God's elect? And I wanted to, to read article 12 from um, heading number one. This is a wonderful pastoral paragraph. So if you're struggling with this, am I really one of God's elect? Listen to this, Lear, learn from these wise Christian forefathers of of ours. They said this in Article 12, the elect in due time, though in various degrees and in different measures, attain the assurance of this, their eternal and unchangeable election, not by inquisitively prying into the secret and deep things of God, as if any of us could do that, but by observing in themselves with a spiritual joy and holy pleasure, the infallible fruits of election pointed out in the word of God, such as true faith in Christ, filial fear of God, a godly sorrow for sin, a hunger and thirst for righteousness. So I always tell people, you want to know if you're one of God's elect? Look to Jesus Christ and nothing else for the whole of your salvation. Do you see spiritual poverty in yourself? Are you not happy with where you are in terms of your sanctification? That's a blessing from God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Are you resting on Christ's finished work? Only the elect of God can do that. And that's how we know. We contemplate our election by looking into the face of Christ. As John Calvin taught us, Christ is the mirror of our election. And only by looking to him can we contemplate it with safety. Well, brothers, you guys are, are my, my best friends and Royal council. Very thankful for both of you and your comments. It's always so fun and edifying to do this. So uh, lo- I look forward to it every week. <laughs> Praise God. Me too. Thank you all. All right. Amen. All right. Press on. May God be with you this Sunday, this Lord's day as you preach God's word. I'm with me too. You guys Amen. take care. Amen. God bless. Bye-bye. You too. Be